When we go out, I mean, we're looking for um, situations of abuse and neglect and then responding to those. What we're finding as we're responding to, you know, individual instances of abuse and neglect that we find, um, we're really finding more of a like systemic neglect, um, just a systemic failure of these facilities and of the state to regulate these facilities. It's not being addressed that these kids are being re-traumatized inside these facilities. Restraints are heavily relied on. So a restraint is intended for safety, just like you restrain a child in a car seat. Um, it's, it's intended to, to keep them safe keep them from getting injured. Well, you're supposed to restrain with two people. So there never was supposed to be a single person restraint. So automatically you've got two people, you know, on a kid. The goal of it is, you know, for one person to be on, on each side and have their, their arms. This restraint ends up becoming very, very, it can become violent where, like I've been on restraints where literally we had seven, eight adults on a kid. If two residents are fighting or if a, a kid becomes aggressive with a staff member tries to start attacking them, um, maybe for self-harming um, and they can't get the kid to stop so they have to restrain them. Um, it, it, that's what we see a lot and when possibly it's you know justified that the child is being restrained. Um, but those are oftentimes they um, are very vague circumstances that are reported. So you know like a kid that you know says the kid was becoming aggressive and they were restrained. You know well, what does that mean that they were you know were they screaming at you were they walking towards you quick fast you know and you decided to restrain them on the ground you know um, and that goes along with kind of the regulation of all these that um, that's being accepted as you know a valid reason for for restraining a child if a child has had trauma their whole lives and people put their hands on them they're going to go back into survival mode and then they are going to have that they are going to keep fighting they are going to keep fighting because that is what their body says to do is fight you can't go into seclusion usually without being restrained there has to be a restraint for them to go into seclusion. When you are talking about kids who have been abused and traumatized and you put your hands on them, they are going to fight. When they start fighting and you have a bunch of people, you know, staff on them, the more's on them, the more they're going to fight, then it's, you're going, okay, well, we're going to have to put you in the seclusion room. Most of these seclusion rooms are like cinder block rooms, right? There's concrete walls and a concrete floor. This child is escalated, possibly a danger to themselves or others. Um, so there's, you know, a real possibility they could harm themselves inside this room. Um, but also that's not a very calming environment, right? Um, being locked in a cinder block room. Um, that's not a way that a child, especially a child that's become this escalated, probably has a trauma history, is going to be able, you know, to calm themselves down. It's hot, it stinks in there, it smells like urine. There's blood on the wall where they've hit their heads on the wall, where they've busted their noses on the wall. There's no air moving. I, I don't know that you would see something like this in a jail. Most of the time, staff do not have the tools or training they need to effectively de-escalate. If you're going to effectively de-escalate a situation, you have to really understand trauma, you have to understand that particular child, um, and and have the tools and be able to. So if you're the only staff member on a unit, you may recognize that this child is escalating and needs to be maybe removed from the unit, um, you know, to calm down or be in a different space. But if you don't have the staff to remove them, right? Um, I mean, the only option is for the, the situation to continue to escalate until the child is restrained. Um, so that's not giving them the tools that they need. Every child is unique and there are specific triggers. There are specific things that they could know about a child that would help them you know, de-escalate a situation. We had a child that, um, you know, he was 15, but he, he could not read at all. Um, and that was not shared with the staff members. So, you know, when he got very angry, when asked to read something and sign it and things escalated, right? I mean, that was a very simple fix that should have been on their, you know, that should have been information passed along to staff members working on that unit that this child couldn't read instead of putting him in that position. There are very serious in individual instances of abuse and neglect. Like overall, the bigger issue is um, the failure of these types of facilities to provide a therapeutic environment and treat kids. Um, they definitely could be better.
Um, and I think that's the pushback that we get a lot is that, you know, well, you, you want to shut us down. And that's not necessarily right. We want kids to get meaningful treatment. Um, if you think that can, you know, if there's a way that can happen in a congregate setting, then show us that. Right. Um, but that's not what's being shown right now. And there doesn't seem to be a strong desire to improve.